Just gonna sit there and drink coffee. Sipping that Americano, dude. That Damn. midday Americano. That's a that's a bold move. Did you have a, a mid morning Americano as well? Yeah, dude. You gotta have you gotta have one before camp and then one mid camp. Mid camp as well. Yeah. Okay. So I like it. I'm I'm a I'm a two cold brews a day guy, and I don't even like cold brew, and it makes me scared. But I just do <laughs> it, dude. I can't drink cold brew. It gives me anxiety yeah i know i just i can have nine shots of espresso i'm okay i wouldn't say i'm okay but i'm on the verge of an anxiety collapse where a cold brew can maybe take me over it's really hit or miss sometimes like i'll drink enough coffee where i'm either gonna <laughs> have to lay in my bed scared all day or i have to do a <laughs> bunch of shit that i would have never done if i didn't drink a ton of coffee we don't get if we don't hear from ryan within like three to four hours like Ryan, did you drink too much coffee again? I think there was a there was a recent uh, studio session that I was like two hours late because I was had, you're sitting I, in your car. <laughs> no, I worked out and then I I had like done I like lifted weights and then I got on the bike and then I chugged a giant cold brew and my heart rate would not go low and it was like at like one thirty and I was just sitting on my bed like an hour later and I was like. I can't drive to the studio right now. <laughs> There's no way. I felt fucking weird. Yeah. And I, I, t- I remember texting you guys and be like, yo, I'm going to be like an hour late. I just got to wait till like my heart rate will go down because I think that drinking a shitload of caffeine after my heart rate was already really high, not the smartest idea. Yeah. Um, have you been doing any of the Wim Hof breathing Dude, exercises on your own? I was doing it every single day for like months and I felt great. And then once I started feeling great, I just stopped doing it. I do that with a lot of things. It's kind of like when you're taking antibiotics and you're like three days into it and you're like, Oh, I feel better. And then you just stop taking them. But that's probably a good move because antibiotics fuck you up, but you're supposed to take all of them because if you don't, if you only take half, you can like, that's how like antibiotic resistant illnesses are created because it can come back and then it's already used to the antibiotics. So antibiotics won't work on it anymore. Okay. And that's why people uh, get gonorrhea and then they can't fix it at all. <laughs> gonorrhea. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to say words different because it feels better. <laughs> so you get gonorrhea. <laughs> like <laughs> nice little accent on it. Yeah. You got you to gotta put some mustard on it, you know, when you're talking. Uh, yeah. I had, I had an experience uh, a couple maybe like a month or two ago where I had a session at the studio that was about to start in like 15 minutes and I was having a day, bro. It was yeah. just one of those days where you don't want to wake up. Everybody's fucked. Everyone. You don't really know why, <laughs> yeah. but you want to justify and ripping someone's head off. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I was having one of those days and dude, I was about to cancel the session cause I was like, yo, I'm just, I was kind of having, not a panic attack. I've never really had a panic attack to my knowledge. Yeah. But if I ever have, maybe this was getting close to it. And uh, I, I forced myself to do a Wim Hof, you know, the 11 minute breathing exercise. Yeah. Where you just lay down and focus on your breathing. And I felt like a different person after. Like totally different. Like I, I felt relaxed. I felt I felt silly for feeling the way I did 11 minutes earlier. It really works when i so like um I but went all to, you're doing is breathing i know how but crazy is that but you like so my friend is uh he was a paramedic forever now he is like radiology and um in hospitals and stuff but he um when he was a paramedic he's like you know what most people need is like when they come in here we give them fluids and we give them oxygen he's like nobody breathes as much as they should and if they have pr- trouble breathing he's like you never get enough oxygen and I've noticed it myself. I'm a very like naturally shallow breather. I never take big deep breaths. And then sometimes I'm just in the middle of a sentence. I'm out of fucking breath and I have to like take a big gasp, you know? And like people have commented like, why are you breathing like that? It's like, I don't know. I just, that's natural, you know? So it makes sense that if you're over oxygenating your body, like you never do that ever. You're never giving yourself that much oxygen. And I don't know, it just feels good. So even if it's, even if all it's doing is making you a little dizzy and whatever because you're too oxygenated, like 
it's helpful because it takes your mind off of whatever you're thinking about already. But afterwards for like a couple hours after I feel more energetic and I'm like ready to go about my day. Yeah. It, let's, think, let's go ahead and take a deep breath for all the listeners out there. Ready? Three, two, one. We're all going to take Stevie. You're going to take one, two, <laughs> one, two, three. <gasps> you can't hold it. Dude, this is why you come to camp, man. You come to just get that oxygen. You about I to, didn't you do just it. Fill your lungs, dude. I didn't do it. Uh, fill fill our lungs, dude. When my I my first band. Hold on, this has nothing to do with anything. My first band, The Evade. We had a song called our hit single was called "Fill Our Lungs with Charcoal." Damn, that's bad. Like that barbecue shit, music. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about some fucking Frankfurters on the on the grill. Fill our lungs with charcoal, dude. That's so punk. Dude. That's so good. Um, where the first time I ever did one of those breathing exercises was while we were recording sucker and we were out at, uh, Matt Keller's house in globe and awesome Jones was with us and you guys all like forced me to do it. And I was, we like, all I laid in that it. tiny room together and yeah. did it, right? Yeah. yeah. I was on the floor. There was like uh bunk beds, uh, Tanner, you, me and Jones. Yeah. What was your experience? It was way harder than I thought because like you it, you get to this mental point where you kind of feel like you're going to pass out and you have to like just break through it and just keep going and then like allow yourself to feel weird and like that's where like the benefit is. Did you feel the um, did you feel the numbness and vibrating in like your face and your arms or your feet? Kind of but like since it was my first time I wasn't able to hold my breath that long. That's normal. So, I notice even if I do it a couple days in a row. The third day in a row I do it, I can hold my breath way longer. Oh, yeah. Isn't that too. crazy? Yeah, even in like, but also if I stop, I have a hard time. Like the next time, if I go like a week or two without it, the next time I can't hold my breath at all. Yeah. But yeah, I remember laying in there, I was on the floor and I was just kind of laughing because I was like, I felt like this was really dumb. We're just sitting in here like hyperventilating uh, five guys in a fucking bunk beds. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was weird. And then afterwards I was like, oh, I actually... Which is weird because you're actually really used to hyperventilating with five guys. I can only <laughs> sleep if there's five guys breathing really hard in my room. So. <laughs> uh, I meant like you hyperventilating while eating five guys. Oh, like the burgers? Or yeah, the like people? the burgers. Okay. Or, or, the, or, the, or the people, I don't know. Five guys. So wait, anyways, five of us are in this room. We're breathing heavy. Yeah. Tell, walk me through what happens. What's going on with your body? I feel great. And then I walk out of the room and I immediately chug about 18 <laughs> ranch waters and then by the end of them, I'm like, these are starting to taste like motor oil. And I look at Tanner. I was like, does this taste like motor oil to you now? And he's like, this does not taste good anymore. I was like, I feel awful. But I did for, for about an hour or two. The breathing really helped. Yeah, there's something that does and, and it resets. Uh, you know that feeling when the, when the wheel is just spinning and you know nothing productive is spinning inside of that wheel yeah. and it just won't stop? It's, it seems to slow that wheel down. Yeah, it does. Because like <laughs> while you're doing it, especially if you're holding your breath for like a minute and a half or whatever it is at the end of it, you're like, it's very mind over matter again. So if you're fully focusing on like trying to not think about needing a breath in, you can't think about anything else because all you're, you're doing is trying to like, it's real, like it forces you to like do Singular real meditation. Focus. You know? Yeah, because you're like, okay, I feel like, the tingling my body but you ever get it where your hands like cripple up and okay <laughs> well well dude no 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 that's, that's real. a real thing right but did i yeah. tell you so i did a breathwork class a somatic breathwork class and this is what's so funny is like i showed up to this thing and it was it was with a yoga community so a bunch of people that do yoga um but the, the woman that was hosting this somatic breathwork class was not at all like the got feathers in her hair and wooden beaded necklaces. Like she she literally was like, looked like a normal just woman that like owned like a corporate company. Okay. Very just not, not what you think about spirituality. I think no patchouli. There's no patchouli. You know what I'm saying? Super normal. Um, and you know, she, we start the class and even me, like I had this kind of like, Oh, this is bullshit, but like, I'm, I'll try it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, you know, we do this 30 minute somatic breath work class. And by the end of the class, I would say 80% of the people in this class are laying on the ground crying. And after you do 15, 20 minutes, once you get to the 20 mark of the heavy breathing, yeah. your body starts, uh, my hands 
literally like they start they felt like pieces of petrified wood that i couldn't move <laughs> anymore and i just felt all of this stuff trying to come out uh of my body and it was super emotional like I had this insane experience where my dad came and sat next to me and started talking to me. Oh, you were like I, tripping kind of? Oh, dude, tr- dude, tripping on I was I was like experiencing something that was higher than um even certain mushroom trips I've done. Really? Oh, for sure. Like yeah, the feeling was like euphoric all over my entire body but also like kind of scary because i could feel that i was resisting and not letting go of certain things and then we spent the you know after the the somatic breathwork class ended we sat and talked about it and what was cool about it dude is that there was a couple other dudes in there that i i had the feeling they got dragged to it as well and in a sense of like oh whatever i'll try it that just had a crazy experience just like i did and everyone kind of went around the room talking about what they experienced what they went through and um, it was wild. No, no drugs at all. Yeah. No, nothing. No, you know what I mean. And and it makes you really wonder, like, what kind of state of consciousness you can get to, just by breathing too much. Breathing too <laughs> much. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, so all right. So if you're doing like a thirty minute one, because I've only ever done like the YouTube Winhof guided one where it's like eleven minutes, and you do three sessions where the first one you breathe in for however many time, and then you hold it for like a minute on the first one and the next two are like a minute and a half, maybe two minutes. And, uh, so you're doing three of them at a 11 minute session. What, how many do you do for so, 30? So in the 30 minute one, you know how the rounds in the hip, the Wim Hof one are only like two minutes long or whatever. Yeah. We did like eight to nine to 10 minutes of full straight breathing, not stopping. Uh, and it's, it just, it, dude, it, it takes you to a different place. Yeah. I don't know what it is. It was wild. And, uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't done one since that was maybe like a year ago. Did you walk out like all weird? Sometimes when I'm done, I'm like, I'm like, I can't fucking, walk. uh, you know how you I need feel? to take a Have you ever, have down. you ever been in a float, a float tank? No. It felt like that. It felt like leaving a yoga class or it felt like leaving, um, like a super intense workout or like sauna. Like yeah. the, you feel like, uh, you were you were a dirty sponge when you went in and then you got wrung out and all the dirty water like temporarily has come out for the night and you go home and you just feel you feel lighter you feel like you got rid of something yeah that's that's the best way i can describe it how that, how doing it, it again uh, now that we're talking about it i could yeah i know and I, I need to be I, I think i need to do it more as well because i, I just notice it it brings me back to a centered place when everything feels like it's just all over the place. Yeah, no, it like, it weirdly works. And I was like, you know, I'm the most like skeptical on things. Yeah. I'm just like, yeah, it's bullshit. You just kind of, you hyperventilate and then you have too much oxygen you feel dizzy and then you're like, oh, cool. But it really does like help just wash away bullshit because you, you can only think about the one thing and then afterwards you're like, I feel good. When I went to uh, Europe and I was like, you know, right after Andy passed and I was in a really weird spot. I was doing it every morning before we had to go anywhere. Cause oh, it would nice, be like, dude. Oh, we have these, you know, you have to go all these plans and shit. And I just didn't feel like doing anything. So I yeah. do it and then I would go or I'd like work out and then breathe and then go. And yeah. I've done it. Helped. I've done it at the studio quite a bit. Um, yeah. I like it, where you like, cause when you're holding your breath, you try to like, I don't know. You, you blow out a lot of air, but I don't like go too much. So that I still have like a little bit cause I don't want to feel like that's where you kind of get that emergency feeling as if you're like completely let go of all. I air. think you're mainly supposed to focus on bringing air in. Right. Yeah. But like once you're holding, you can like let out air and then you hold, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, but I like feeling like your heart rate slow down cause you can like feel, dude, you can it, physically feel it through your whole body of like, do and it, you it can, feels good because yeah you, you can feel yourself taking control of your body yeah and you notice that's like, interesting if you're not if you're not lasting that long with the holding of your breath because sometimes i'll do it and i'll be like like before i'd ever done it i could only hold i would hold my breath for like 30 seconds and be like i need a breath you know but then once you do it the next day you're already at do you know the minute. story behind wim hof are you familiar with him at all and like what he's been through no but i know he uh 
he injected himself with food poisoning so that's why i'm like a, a big champion he, of it because i'm afraid inject, of food he injected poisoning. himself with uh e. coli, or e. coli. Yeah. yeah and then went to a university and people then, have, people have been doing tons of studies on him because yeah. i know because it sounds like the most bullshit thing of all time honestly like if you just put it out there and be like hey this guy can like hike mount everest with no clothes on he, and no shoes he's real and, but, but he like does it so i don't know if like really the breathing can make anybody do that but i do believe he is just different there's something different about him and he knows how to actually control yeah i don't so i don't know a ton about him to be honest with you uh but i do know i think his his wife died uh tragically i i i hope i'm saying this right i I believe that's what happened but it sent him through this entire journey of like trying to heal himself yeah and i think a big part of the breathing is is that for him taking control over you know what's in front of him and his do you, breath do you uh do it before you go into like the ice things i haven't i don't do the cold plunge thing a lot yeah like i've done it a few times um do you know what i started doing is uh i don't have one at, at home or anything yeah, me so either. and you know also it sucks and i don't like doing it <laughs> but, but uh you can get like a big bowl and fill it up with ice and ice water. And then if you just submerge your whole face in it and hold your breath with ice water just around here, it still triggers the like diving response. Yeah. Which is similar to what happens like when your like lungs like contract and stuff when you get into a full body cold plunge. But like it, it's pretty wild. Like you just do it for hold your breath for like 10, 15 seconds into this ice bucket, which cold showers it, are the shit. Sounds really easy. My, my it's shower, not. it's so hot in Arizona right now. My shower doesn't get cold. Yeah, me either. Like it doesn't get cold enough for me to take an actually like cold shower. Yeah, there's no cold water in Arizona. So, but. What are you going to do, you know? What are you going to do, man? Did you have a, yeah, you had a swimming pool growing up, right? Yeah. Did your dad ever get like big ice blocks and you guys would like put ice in the pool? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, really? Just to make the cool pool. The, the the pool colder yeah a lot of people do it because like by usually by this time of year <laughs> but it's not like that this year for some reason but usually it gets too hot to go swimming because it's so hot outside and then the pool is also warm so you're like it's just not enjoyable yeah but people would like put get these like big giant ice blocks um yeah dude we had a fucking we had a roof that was you remember the roof to the in my backyard that went, oh, up, yeah, to, yeah. went up to the pool We'd always jump off the roof into the pool and my mom wasn't home. <laughs> and one time my grandma, because my grandma was living with us at the time, and we were all jumping off the roof into the pool and she came outside and had like a, she was having a panic attack. Was Andrew, your, don't, ju- <laughs> please stop doing that. <laughs> she had a funny voice. <laughs> she did. Dude, was her she, name Pepper or was her cat's name Pepper? She had the classic grandma voice. Pepper was our house cat yeah, growing up. That's right. I had, dude, at one point we had chickens a wiener dog, a Great Dane, two birds, two cats, and... <laughs> you just had birds? Yeah, dude. We had a rooster at one point that Ruby caught one day, our Great Dane, and like plucked all the ha- all feathers out of its back. And then my dad had to set up a gated off area that was in the shade with like misters for this rooster so it didn't die during the summer. Oh my God. Yeah. We had a lot. Of, we had a lot of animals at one point. Yeah, completely off topic. But one time we had to watch our neighbor's rabbit, and it chewed through a um, a dart, an electric dartboard, and died. <laughs> so it's your it's your fault. Well, it, Dude, we your put friend... the cage right next to an electric dartboard, and nobody really thought about it. I hope your friend that just asked you to watch his dog doesn't see this clip from the podcast. That's true. Yeah, I mean. Don't I'm worry, just dude. Gonna make sure that the dog isn't anywhere. Well, the dog. All right. So the dog that I'm going to be watching is um, he's the, blind, like as a bat. He cannot see, and his eyes look like you're looking into the future. If he looks at you, it's like nebulas in there. It's wild. And then he also cannot hear a single thing. So he's completely blind, completely deaf. He's got to be like 17 or 18 years old, little rat terrier, like a wishbone kind of dog, you know. Like picture like wishbone if he was like a wizard or something. That's what he looks like. And, uh, and he, but like <laughs> he can find like I, every time I go over there, he doesn't even move. Like you walk into the door, he doesn't flinch cause he has no idea. He can't hear or see at all. And then he like lets himself out into the backyard, but he runs into every oh, wall no. thing. 
<laughs> but he's like so happy and he still eats and he's still like healthy. That's crazy. But it's just like. How old is he? He's got to be like 16, 17, 18. <laughs> he's 37. <laughs> Dude, this dog is old, but he's a good he's dog. the oldest dog ever. He, he's, a, he's a good boy. But I'm just hoping. Because <laughs> like not only is there so much that I could do wrong because he's diabetic and I have to like check his blood sugar and give it like the right amount of insulin <laughs> so that it survives. But like this dog is just a little bit of a wild card where it's just, you know, God could come in and take over and I, have, any, no, I have nothing I can do about at, God. You at know? any moment. There's nothing I can do. If you're God not getting in God's me. way. So I'm just hoping that God doesn't come into the equation while I'm, uh, while I'm there for one week, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, who knows? Yeah. Dude, remember, I remember we had a friend who got a, a pet goat and uh, his name, the goat's name was Gucci. And uh, <laughs> we, I remember like years later I ran into him and I was like, Where's, who's taking care of Gucci? Because he was in, in Arizona. No, he came him. to the mother's market when I was working there and asked me where the, the like he, he walks in and he goes, dude, what should I feed oh, my yeah, goat? Oh yeah, that was you. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? He's like, dude, Gucci's sick. I need to get him goat food like what do i feed him I'm like dude i don't fucking know i don't have a yeah, goat this isn't a goat store <laughs> this is a, <laughs> this is a natural foods market not a goat market no years later we asked uh, i think it was like he was talking to andy or somebody but they're like who's taking care of gucci while you're here and he discussed god and we're like what? <laughs> he's like yeah gucci died we don't know what happened <laughs> Dude, he was so funny. He had a fucking elevator. He had an elevator in that house that he'd bring the goat in with with him into the elevator. Dude, remember when I fell onto a champagne flute and it broke off in my hip? Yeah. And then I was just so fucked up. I went out after and I went to a club for like twelve hours. I woke up and I was like, somebody stabbed me, and it was just me. I stabbed me. So, so st- who stabbed me? I had to go to the hospital. That was the worst I've ever felt. I think was waking up after that hangover. And then also realizing I was in a pool of my own blood and then having to go to the hospital and like still being kind of fucked up when I got to the hospital, but then it was like wearing off and then they're just pulling glass out of my side. Uh, and then I get, uh, I had no car when we lived in California. And so I had to get into a taxi and they, I was like so hung over by this point. And, uh, they gave me like, a um, like Percocet or something like some sort of like painkiller. And I started getting like really nauseous. I was in the back of this taxi. And I was like, and so we're going, I was like, all right, I have like five minutes. And like, I'm, I'm going to throw up as soon as I get out of this taxi. I, I, there's only five more minutes of the ride. Like I can just hold this. And like, you know, you start getting like the sweaty lips and I'm a bandage and uh, like 20 stitches in my side. And uh, we're, we're getting to the turn to get over to our neighborhood. And he just makes a wrong turn and it turns it into a 20 minute drive where I'm just in the backseat, like pale <laughs> and sweating. And I'm just like, dude, get me out of here. That was, that was the worst. I think when I look back and think about like some of the worst days of my life, the, as far as like how I felt, most of them were in California. Most of them have to do with the house with the elevator. The house with the elevator. <laughs> that place was scary, but we were there every weekend. Oh, I remember man. Andy went to go get, when he got his full like upper arm tattoo done, it was his birthday the night before. So we went out. And we were up, I don't think we slept like that night. And then he's like, can you take me to drop me off at the uh, tattoo place? And I was like, cool. So I drove his car to drop him off there. And he said that he fell asleep for 10 hours while they did his whole arm. And then he just woke up when it was done and he just had a tattoo. <laughs> he's like, it was the best way. Was I that when he got his got back tattoo. done? No, it was the when he got mandala. that uh, one of his arms, he has a full like mandala sleeve and stuff. Yeah. I'm surprised that they did the tattoo with him sleeping, but. That's a, Andy was inked up, bro. He had a lot of tattoos. Yeah. He really liked to tell you that all the people at gas stations would compliment <laughs> them. You're like, cool, dude. <laughs> <laughs> we'd make fun of one of his new tattoos he'd be like oh that's weird because i was just in the gas station five minutes ago and they said that's the coolest tattoo i've ever seen and i was like yeah look at your market andy <laughs> <laughs> look at your market <laughs> yeah i really like I, I miss uh talking shit to him because that was like most of our relationship was just battling each other and who who could say the meaner thing to get you and tanner to laugh that would be me and him just 
constantly trying to say the meanest thing to each other that's and then so one of us would say something that everybody else would start dying laughing you just knew you you either knew that you won or that you completely lost and there's nothing you could say after that one it's, it was the best people we would say the meanest shit dude if people knew what is said inside like tour buses and vans on tour do you mean the amount of bands no band would have a career no, but uh, their careers would be over. Or let's just should we all just put it all on the table? Everyone no, should come we clean. Should not, dude. <laughs> let's not. But I mean, I think that that's like anything. Like when you're with your friends, like sometimes I'll be in like my friends group chat, like with a my friend group, and I just realize like if any of these guys ever hate me one day, I'm fucked. It's because over. It's all just me trying to get a reaction out of them. But if if you take anything out of context, it's pretty fucking bad. Yeah. Because you're just like, it just sounds like you're mean. Like you like we, we all talk shit to each other is I only do it to people I love. I, I don't talk like that to like, I wouldn't, if a stranger said something <laughs> yeah. rude to me, I wouldn't like go to their throat. But if it's like my best friend, I'm going to fucking kill you. And I, I'm going to say whatever the meanest thing is. And even if it's like way too far, I'm just going to go there because I want everybody else in the room yeah. to be like, holy shit. <laughs> something, uh, <laughs> one, one of the biggest things I miss about Andy is I miss him. He used to do this all the time in the hotel room. I know he did it to you too, but we'd be sure it'd just be me and him in the hotel. He's in the other bed. I'm in one bed and he just, no one's talking for 20 minutes. We're like looking at our phones and then he'll lean over and he'll just look at me and he'll say without smiling at all. Has anyone, ever t- <laughs> has anyone ever told you how fucking ugly you are? And then he'd just go back to looking at his phone <laughs> and, and, I'd, and it would just be so fucking funny. And he would do that all the time. And also when he was just wanted to talk to you, like say I hadn't talked to him for a couple of days. Yeah. He'd send that text. I just said, Hey, you're really fucking ugly. What are you doing? And then Dude. that's like how our conversation would start. But he would just say something really, really mean to get your attention there and then laugh phase, and go back to whatever he was doing. There was a phase where he was sending me videos and he's like, he's like, Hey, I'm i uh, I'm going to start, I'm practicing for um, like doing movies. I want to be an actor. <laughs> and then he would send a video of him just going <laughs> and he would just start laughing and then he would stop as fast as he could and just like do a straight face. And it was the funniest shit ever because he'd just be dying laughing, but then he would stop and then you could tell in his face, he was like, try not to keep laughing. <laughs> it was so funny. Dude, Andy but I know was the like, funniest. Fu- was he's, funny stuff. he's one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. Oh, it was hilarious. Like, so, so like when we, I, had- I loved, I loved listening to him make fun of people when we were on tour. It, it was, was the, the funniest shit in the world. He was so good at it. It was so good. But then if he like, <laughs> if he didn't know what to say, he would just have the word. Like sometimes he would have no, like when me and him would go against each other, sometimes I'd get him so good that and he, he, would, he wouldn't have anything to say. And he'd be like, no, you do. And you're just like, oh my God, I won. Because he just would have nothing to say that it was just like the worst comeback of all time. <laughs> like, like a little child's comeback. And you're like, oh my God, this is fucking perfect. This is really funny. When we, when we would tour with uh, Corey Davis and him, it was like probably the funniest. Like, I think that month was the funniest month because Corey Davis is also one of the funniest people I've ever met in my entire life. Yeah. And uh, so it's just like all of us really miserable on tour. That's when I'm my funniest too is when I'm just like really struggling. And it was just, everybody was so brutal for like two months on the road. It was, it was There great. is something, I think there is something really important for guys, especially when you're growing up to have friends that say really mean shit to your face and have all of your other friends laugh at that. I yeah. think that's good for you. Dude, absolutely. It's really good especially for you. If everybody's always picking on the same thing about you. If it's something that like you can't change, then that, that's just mean. But if it's something that is like about your personality or whatever, like eventually you start to realize like, like, Oh, I'm oh this is real. Oh, like <laughs> what I'm doing <laughs> is actually annoying. don't like that about me. I'm being annoying. I need to change it. It's uh, having people that actually say no to you. Because like, as soon as you get into a place where no, everybody just say, thinks everything you do is fucking cool, you're fucked. Yeah, I remember when me and Andy would get in arguments and you guys would call it tart-offs. <laughs> 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 We'd just be like, holy shit, you guys are... Because you guys would fight about the dumbest shit. And then it'd be like... <laughs> It would be like real, like aggressive, like yelling at each other about like the dumbest shit. And me and Tanner would just look at each other and be like, it's happening again. 
this might and be then the we, best one. I remember sometimes that would piss me off because I knew whatever I was arguing with Andy about, I was right. But then you guys would just be going a step further to call us both fucking stupid because we're having an argument. And then, yeah, that would be... It was, it, we would really just, fun. Yeah, we would definitely egg each other out. Or if like sometimes if I knew somebody was wrong and the like say I knew Andy was wrong and you're right, I would just chime in and say that Andy was right so that he would think that he had like some more momentum to just keep going after you. And, <laughs> and we just sit back and be like, holy shit, you guys have just been yelling at each other for like an hour about the dumb yeah. shit. But to be honest, man, we actually all got along really fucking well because we've spent a lot of time around other bands that have like actually oh, yeah. like actually don't get along with each other and i think but when we would make fun of each other it was like out of love like i said you know it's like it's stuff that you would only say to like your brother or your like best friend it was a brother relationship but then you, yeah. we would be around other bands on tour and we would see them have fights and you're like oh these guys don't like each other it's yeah. like we all like each other and we're just picking at each other because we're fucking bored <laughs> we have a 15 hour drive and like yeah, we get annoyed with each other because you're always in everybody's space, but it's not like a real personal thing. But then you would see like a personal <laughs> fight and you'd be like, oh, that's like, that feels different than what would we're you, doing. Would you rather was a fun game in the van. Oh, uh, we would, would you rather to like the worst things. We would just fun, come up with the funniest stories. A lot of them would be like, would you do this for the that band for a year? <laughs> And then you got paid a like, hundred grand for a year. <laughs> would you rather do merch for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny, man. Th- those are like. Or getting trapped. Yeah. Is it like We'd now? come up with like hypothetical stories of like, what if you got trapped and you had to live in like some shitty city that we just, had just played <laughs> or something? I just remember like we would like look outside and we'd all just start roasting people just on the street, <laughs> like walking around. <laughs> <laughs> we'd all just like whoever could say like, oh, that looks like our friend, like whatever friend's name, we'd be like, oh yeah, that's uh, so-and-so, but with like a meth problem and everybody would just start dying laughing. <laughs> but like, I just... Dude, sometimes, sometimes you it see was really people funny. that literally look like your friends on tour. Yeah, they look like your best friend that's just having the worst day of their life. And then we all would just... <laughs> you're like, damn, what's he doing in Ohio? <laughs> dude, things aren't going I remember, so well. <laughs> Dude, I remember one time we were in the van and this dude was walking across the street and he was kind of chubby and he had a shopping cart full of a bunch of trash. <laughs> and you said, Andy, that's you in five years. <laughs> and it looked just like Andy plus like 20 pounds, dude. It dude. looked just like him. And it was like one of the funniest fucking things in the world. Yeah. The best is when it looked like one of us. <laughs> like that was that's, by all time. That favorite. was the jackpot. Like, you'd see somebody dude. like just like in their car just like with no ac and they're sweating their ass off and they're just shoving like chicken wings in their mouth and you're like it looks like you you're like dude it looks like you. yeah you're not doing well in 10 years like i remember <laughs> yeah a lot of the time it was like somebody that like looked like you but they were like completely bald or something it was like it was just like things that were just different about yeah. you're like it's almost you if you just completely let everything go and you weren't in a band yeah that's fun oh damn dude yeah i, you- I really miss touring like a lot I think about it all the time. It's just, that's like the most fun for me. And like when you're doing it, like we got to the point, I've said this a bunch of times where I was starting to feel pretty burnt out by that last tour that got canceled. I was like, it's like, this is going to be hard. I was not like really looking forward to going on tour. Cause we like didn't have a tour manager. We were doing everything ourselves and we were doing a lot of work. And so I was just like, this is going to be the longest month of my fucking life. But now that the perspectives kind of flipped, it's like, damn I, I miss like just being in those shitty cities and in like a fucking truck stop in the middle of nowhere and just laughing and buying you know t-shirts at the gas station and uh stuff it's, it's really yeah. fun there's nothing like really compares to being with your friends and then being in all these weird situations and if it like for the most part if you, one of you is having a really bad day like chances are it's something that's affecting everybody else too so it's like Oh, like the worst day could be, you know, your van broke down, you're stuck in the middle of nowhere. But it's like you're also with five other people that are trying yeah, to Yeah, you're the best also of it. not alone, man. Yeah. That that's kind of what was interesting. I remember uh, you know, that that Iration two thousand nineteen summer tour we did, that was right I lost my dad in the middle of that tour. So on the second leg of that tour, this you know, the Oh yeah. The last that. the last like, you know, twenty five shows of that tour. Um, was right after my dad passed. And I just remember 
feeling so stoked that I had so many people around me. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it wasn't like, even if you're going through a rough time, you weren't alone. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, that's well, one really whole... cool thing about tour. When you're on a tour with a bunch of good dudes and like, that is one cool thing about our scene too, man. I feel like, I feel like I've heard other artists that we're friends with in different scenes, like, you know, metal bands or whatever, speak a little differently about like, you know, just how they get along and yeah. all the bands in our scene for the most part really get along really well. And like, we're all friends with each other. We all know each other. It's just such a massive community of friends that we'll have until we die. Like I, yeah. I could go, that's one cool thing about tour. You do a whole tour with these guys for a summer. You can go 20 years without seeing one of them. And the moment you see them, it's like, Oh, what's up, dude? Like I miss you. How you been? It's yeah. It's, Cause you, you live with them and then you're all in the same place every day. Yeah. So like, I mean, obviously we've done tours where you don't really get that close to the other people on it. And those ones kind of suck because you're like, just the dynamic of like, if we tour with Iration, then we know, like we know everybody on it and we know it's gonna be a fucking great time. And we're really good friends with every single person that works there or like everybody that's like in their staff and stuff too. So it's like, you yeah. know, you're going to be traveling with this fun, but going on tour with people you don't know, there's that whole like two week period where you kind of have to like feel each other out and you kind of like see what their jokes and see like, how like see how they react see how to far it. you yeah. can push it before they get offended yeah and then yeah, uh, we didn't really know where that line was as a band no we just went all the way and then there was no it. boundary in our uh you know our our van <laughs> there's no boundary anywhere i mean dude we were always just pushing it and just really going for it i think that's what like I mean, I'm sure we rubbed some people wrong because we were just fucking crazy in the early days, but other people I think liked it because we were just, we were ourselves and we, if, ourselves. like somebody was like way, you know, in a bigger position or like we'd walk up to the headliners band and just walk into their green room and be like, what the fuck's up? You know, <laughs> like they're like, who are these kids? These kids are insane. And we just start the conversation with them because other times, I mean, obviously there's so much like etiquette that you have to know. And we fucked up a lot where you have to learn hey, you got to give people their space. They don't have to be with you. You're lucky to be on this tour. Like, don't annoy them. But on the other hand, it's like, if you don't go out and start talking with them and like, if you never become friends with them, then that's just, you have one tour. But if you become friends with them, it could be multiple tours. And I don't know, it's been uh, every, like all the tours, most of them, I'd say almost all, every tour we ever did was from our relationship with the artist and not necessarily like, Oh dude, we had an many, agent going out and doing it. We had many booking agents getting their 10% when they didn't do shit. Yeah. And it was dude straight up. Like I was thinking about this recently, bro. Like the first before Gonzo, like really stepped in to help manage the band. You know, I remember doing so many phone calls with random people just to see what shows I could get us on. Because I didn't know how else, you know, I would, I would like, I would message people on MySpace and be like, Hey, like, yeah. I want to play a show. We didn't have a booking agent. So I just remember always being stressed out. Like, how are we going to get it? How we, how are we going to keep doing things? Like we got to keep playing shows when we first moved out to California too. Yeah. I remember just constantly being on the phone, trying to hit up people like Sam Scarce and Chris Hurley. Right. And I mean, we other, always had managers though before Gonzo too, but it was always this. Yeah. I mean, you like starting any kind of business, you like, you start working with people that they say they're going to help you out with a lot. And I hope that whoever, like when I'm saying this, like, I hope nobody that thinks I'm talking about them, it's not them. You know, I'm just saying in general and in the very, very early days, but it's like people that, you know, they're like, oh, we can, we got this, we got that. We got all these connections, like come through and like they buy you dinner and they do all this stuff. And then you're just kind of like, you start working with them and nothing ever happens or you realize like, Hey, we're not getting paid as much as you said we were going to get paid for this show. And you know, they're like a lot of like lines get crossed and, um, it's really easy to get like taken advantage of, especially when you're young and you have no idea what's going on. Yeah. And especially when you're young and you don't have much to bring to the table, it's like, are you even manageable? Right. Like, is there anything to actually manage? Do you have, cause the person has to actually believe in you because they're not getting, and I'm speaking from a anything. point of us not being manageable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're like, to man. like, uh, no, just that like in the past before we were ever really doing anything as a band, I remember getting very frustrated. Like, well, why can't our manager get that, get us this and get us that? It's like, maybe you're not ready to play big shows. Like maybe you guys aren't actually ready to go on a massive tour. Like yeah. even that first big dirty heads tour we got, it's, 
pre debate. That was kind of like a hookup. <laughs> like that. Well, that was a hookup, but like to be honest, we were not ready for no. that tour. We pulled it off. We, to some degree, rose to the occasion of like doing that tour. You know, we didn't die. Yeah, we also got like dangerously close to ruining our careers on multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so I think uh, there's, I don't know, there's also timing with all this stuff. And it's like, you got to put yourself into a position where you work hard enough to where other people start believing in what's there. And I think that's one of the hardest parts of being an artist is uh, having more belief in yourself before everyone else around you does. Yeah. And I think that's something that we did as a band together. I think the four of us believed in it, what it could be. So even when there were moments where no one else around us did and we didn't have a manager at the time or, you know, uh, we didn't I, care. We just like knew we were better. <laughs> you know, it's like we did not, not we in like, knew not we in were like an asshole way. It's like we knew we were good at performing live and like maybe we were selling ourselves short by showing up fucked up and not actually doing the part, but we knew what we were capable of and we knew it right away. Like, Hey, I don't want to be like the best in a scene. Like I want to be the best. Like I want to be good where people yeah. look back and are like, wow. And it's like, I remember after every tour, like years later, I would look back and be like, oh, I wish we had the material we have now on that tour in the past. And it was just like such a pointless yeah. thought because you need all those steps on those tours. But I do feel another thing that we are grateful to have though, you know, Gonzo, our manager, he, he has undoubtedly believed in the band more than us at multiple times throughout our career. Oh, absolutely. Like to where we were just so frustrated with certain things that were going on either internally with the band or like the position we were in, not getting the shows or the tours that we wanted, feeling stuck, feeling frustrated. Like, dude, for the amount of times that we have felt like that as a band. Oh yeah. I just feel well, like, I don't know if it. there's any other, I don't know if any artists or, you know, younger artists or people that are trying to, even make a career in a creative path, you're going to run into shit that m makes you feel like you're stuck oh, and that yeah. you're going nowhere. And when that happens, I remember we would get in a really, we, we had a really bad pattern as a band to just get in like bad group chat arguments yeah. about dumb shit. And it would just be a negative bad cycle that we'd repeat over the years. Yeah. We finally got better at that and stopped doing that as much for the most part for the no, most part we still do it sometimes but uh i i i i do want to stress that having a manager that truly believes in your band yeah is very beneficial and gonzo has has believed in us when we when there was no benefit when, when to him. we maybe yeah. didn't believe in ourselves and he wasn't benefiting financially but i think somewhere deep in his heart he truly believed that the band was special and he believed that we had a gift and he, you know, he was helping us before he even managed us to book There's shows and put us on shows. And, and even when I think about, you know, uh, pushing us when we were younger, like I remember when we first started working with Gonzo to play local shows, he was our promoter and he'd give yeah. us tickets and he fucking scared me. He was like intimidating. He, he'd call me and be like, did you sell those 200 tickets yet? Like what the fuck's up, dude? Yeah. And he'd, he'd tell me, you don't want to end up like these other local bands. You don't want to end up, you want to play national act shows. And yeah. like at the time I remember thinking like, this guy's such a fucking asshole. And then years later now I'm like, damn, he pushed us when we needed to be pushed to yeah. build our own fan base. I don't even know if he truly knew that he was like, like pushing no, us. I think he was this. probably just being an asshole. Back <laughs> <He then. was. laughs> yeah, fuck you, dude. It really did like work out for us because we learned very quickly. It's like, Hey, nobody's going to do this for you. You have to do it. And it, you have to sell these tickets. And if you want to sell more tickets than anybody else, then you right now have to go to that gas station and tell everybody on your Facebook, your phone number yeah. and meet up with absolute strangers and psychos at the gas station. Yeah, in the and, of you the have night to, and you have to push yourself when no one else is around to push yourself, yeah. uh, especially as an artist, because there are going to be days like you, like we talked about in the last podcast, like there's going to be days where you don't feel like doing it, but I don't think you can trust yourself to always be inspired. Oh, yeah. Every time we step on stage, there are days where we don't feel inspired to do that right. throughout our career. Where, But we still did it. Like I, I'd still go on stage and play the drums even if I had the flu. I'd yeah, still no, go do it too, because yeah. we had to do it. We were on tour. That's what we do. That's our job. Well, and your own personal actions severely affect at least four other people. So it's like 
that was also if i like i remember being like one show i did i had the flu and i was just miserably sick cold shit like cold sweats the chills cold shit cold shits <laughs> hot shits uh, the no, cold i was shits, like dude. just miserable couldn't like move super body achy and stuff and then we um i remember going and playing the show but it's like everything in me wanted to not do it because i was like i don't think i can stand for an hour like i felt so sick but it's like hey if you cancel the show or you don't show up or you don't do your part then it affects you know straps it affects yeah. andy it affects tanner yeah and we all kind of knew that like anything we did was going to affect everybody else and if i fucked up or i did something really bad then i would have to live with everybody else being upset with me at that time yeah and Andy got really good at not caring that that happened anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it was always this like, you always knew that like, hey, this is like, it. you had to make it worth it. If it's like, if this is going to fuck with everybody else, you better be fucking sure that it's that important that you need it. Because we would go out there. I mean, no matter how sick, no matter how sad, no matter how whatever you feel, you go out there and you do it and you try to put on a face and just play the show. And like, sometimes I felt like, maybe I wasn't able to like really snap out of it and I was just getting through the show. But for the most part, once you get out there and you start playing, it kind of takes over and you're just like, okay, I'm back in it. Like this is what I wanted. Yeah. And then afterwards you can feel like shit again you can go home and you lay down. But it's, it's really weird just having this thing with like, there's no way out. You have to do this and everything you do affects everybody else. So it teaches you a lot of like kind of just minding your own business, knowing when to like, stop like you know obviously we fuck with each other but it's all out of like good intentions so it's like if i could tell that somebody's actually getting upset like i'm not gonna like just keep pushing them unless it's going to be really funny <laughs> <laughs> unless it's it's going to cause a massive eruption in laughter yeah, yeah. um yeah it's crazy how uh there are certain aspects of the years of touring that we've done that are beneficial for even life not on tour. Yeah, for sure. Learning these kinds of things. When you know you're capable of just like buckling down and working your ass off for a month at a time. Like if I you want to know how to put yeah. chains on some tires, which yeah, I know how to Arizona, change a starter. Does that help? No. No, but you know what? I know how to do it. I know how to change a starter. I know how to um I definitely know how to change a fucking tire. I'll tell you that. Yep. I don't know if I ever did that. I think I'd just lay down while you guys did that. I never changed I never put the chains on. Sometimes you guys would wake me up and it'd be like two in the morning. Like, come outside. We're, we've got to put the tires on or like the chains on. I'm just like, we don't need four people to do it. And I'll just go back guys, to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Touring is really what a weird thing to do. That's just touring. Like if you think about the concept of it. I know it's cool though. Like it, it makes sense. You're, you're going around and it's like this traveling fucking business that does this like entertainment but some days it's really bad and the next day it can be fucking amazing you feel like you're on top of the world the next day you're the lowest piece of shit and you're in the diner and you're hung over and all your friends are mad at you and you don't know why <laughs> like, think <laughs> about know? how many tour like honestly how many national tours did we do to new york and back and not make any money when we got home i mean dude countless like no in the no early like days. lost money oh yeah in the early days it was like we would i remember how many tours though like probably like six or seven or eight probably like Maybe yeah i'd probably more. say like five or six we've that probably we, done at least like 20 something national tours at least yeah yeah and there was a lot where we would come home and we'd have less money than we left with and we would just have to figure it out but that's what shows how much dedication we had is we we didn't care and like we never fine. but we never even talked about that that's what's crazy it's it was like this uh it was like this understood feeling that we never talked about that it's just like oh well we're just we're, this is what we're here to do yeah. And I think it might be because I remember the feeling of playing shows, getting done with the show specifically. I remember having this feeling quite a bit when I would be packing up my drums after the show and it would be this feeling of, all right, it's time to pack up now, but you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're exactly where you are supposed to be. That's like the feeling I had after playing shows. Yeah. It, becomes, it was like, well, especially you, you get used to it too. So that becomes your normal. And then you go home and then that's not normal at all. Like home's <laughs> yeah. not normal and it's uncomfortable. And but it is used normal. to that again. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I know. Yeah. And so you just be like, I don't relate to any of these people because I do something fucking wild. And my friends work, you know, they have two days off a week and sometimes we would have 15 all my shows in a row. All and my then friends have are like circus freaks. Off. Yeah. And they're just like, 
like oh yeah all my friends are fucking roadies and like crazy motherfuckers that don't fit into those areas but it's like i think that's why all everybody finds each other in that scene though because like they work hard but they also like party really hard and they're like there's a very big like brother community thing i also think that that's why there's a lot of you know like ex-military in touring because those are like it still has that you know routine of you have to get up at this time you have to be here at that time and from these hours you're going to be doing this work and from this hour to that hour you're going to be doing that work and there's a lot of weird it's like structured chaos of every single day you have to be dependable yeah but it's also like anything can change at any moment and you just have to do it you can't be like nah I mean, what's crazy is like, I remember, uh, Andy would always have a rough time when we finished a tour and when we were back home, I think he just got like, he just didn't really know what to do with himself. Yeah. And I, I remember, you know, talking to one of our old tour managers, Tim about this, but you know, he would always say like, you know, Andy does so well when he's got structure and he's on tour Yeah. and we're working out together in the hotel rooms and he knows he's playing a show every night and we got to leave at this time. We got to do this. It's like, he's got a you know, this strong purpose and strict schedule. And I think the older I get, if I don't have that, it does feel very chaotic. Yeah. I mean, this is the first time in my life I have like a daily routine. Never had that. Cause it's just like, but then also learning how to balance it and yeah. make room for stuff to, to, to be able to pivot and like allow right, other yeah. things to come in and not be so structured to where you're like, Oh, well I already decided I'm doing this. So like, I can't, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I'm still learning how to do that. It's hard. Like, yeah. Sometimes people will hit me up and like, Hey, blah, 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 like tomorrow. And I'm like, it's too late, but it's not, I just, I'm not used to that. But yeah, I don't know. It's a, it really is like the first time in my life. I'm like, okay, I kind of know like, what I'm going to do every day when before it was just chaos. And you're like, I have all this work to get done. We just, we're going to do it. And I'm going to go out for a month and we're just going to finish it. And I'm going to, the first week is always hard. And then the middle weeks are like pretty fun. And then you're like, Oh shit, we're only halfway. And then by the end you're like, get me home. And then you get home and you're like, Oh, this is nice. And then all right, get me on tour. (laughs) This is not so nice anymore. It's just like this constant balance of never. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird uh, seeing like all the bands announce the tours and stuff and go on tour this summer. It feels like so far away to me. For some, I don't know what yeah. the, what I mean by that. I guess I mean like uh, it just feels like it's been a long time since we experienced that. Because I guess it kind of has. It I mean, has been. This know? is the longest period we've ever gone without. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't feel jealous about it. I just feel... Uh, like damn that's fun yeah i think we've talked about this fun, on, but in like a recent episode but yeah i like i do kind of feel jealousy at times and i'm like i was talking to tanner about it recently and i was just like yeah as much as i want to admit or not admit that but it's like yeah i do have jealousy because i miss that and i like that and that was been my whole life and it's not like in a negative way like i don't think other people deserve it but you just know that that should have been you and you're like fuck it's weird it's just different you know yeah but you know what i think yeah yeah i don't know it's just like seeing it from a different lens i guess for sure i mean everything's it's so yeah it's it is weird but i also know that i love all those people too and i hope they're having successful tours there is a part of touring that's fucking exhausting though and i, I, mean, used, honestly, to, I used to I get think a, most of tour is kind I of i used like to get hard. uh i used to get pretty bad anxiety right before we leave for tour oh um, me too dude like trying to get all my stuff packed and like being like like looking at, I remember going on our first like two month tour and looking at the dates and our list and being like, oh shit. And like, as soon as we all got in the van <laughs> and we were like go for day one and we had a two day drive to even start this like 50 show tour. And you're like, oh, we're like, we're not even denting this. And it would feel like the longest time you look at how many days you have left and you're like, we're not even a quarter of the way through this. And I feel like I'm like, I'm ready to go home, but then you get through it and then you get into the fucking groove. Yeah, sometimes when you see a list of that many dates, you don't even think it's possible. And then by the end of the tour, I always remember finishing a Catastro tour, getting home, like the moment I walk through my my door, the first thing I'd always think is like, damn, how did we get through all of that without dying again? <laughs> like, <laughs> like yeah, well, I mean, just you, all the things that have to go right, like how many car accidents we could have been in, how many 
just different scenarios we get put into where like something could have gone wrong. Someone could have, could have got injured. Something could have, you know, we could have missed these many shows, whatever. And we'd still make it through. It's like, damn, that's just, think about how many things could have gone wrong, but they didn't. And we crushed the yeah. tour. And it's like, what the fuck? That's I crazy. remember like one tour, I think we, like we did like Red Rocks or something. And then we played like this rooftop in like Manhattan. You're talking about Wed Walks? Wed Walks. Uh, we played Red Walks. And then we uh, played this rooftop in Manhattan. And then we were like, it was all these like crazy dope fucking places. And then I was home like within like, you know, 30 hours after one of those shows. And I was just like, I, what the fuck? I served tables during a breakfast Sunday uh, rush literally two days after playing sold out Red Rocks. <laughs> The first That's time humbling. we the first time we played Red Rocks two days later. You're like, I was is home there butter tables. on this? You're like, this is a vegan restaurant. It's vegan butter. <laughs> Get uh, it. Can you please take this back to the kitchen? They, I think they put something wrong in my burrito. Like, I, 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 Bitch, just played I played Red Rocks, Red Rocks two days ago. Yeah. You're gonna fucking eat that burrito. <laughs> you. Where's my catering? <laughs> Where's my? I've catering? had a private chef every single day for the last two months, and somebody cleans up all my shit, <laughs> and like all my stuff is folded every day for me, and then now I'm here like. Like Ryan, you forgot to take the trash. I'm like, let's pay somebody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, that was so good there. for me. That was so good for me, though. Oh yeah, I mean, dude, all those moments where you're just you're up there, and then it just fucking crashes, and you're like, oh, you just play like you do something where you're just on top of the world, and then the next day you're stranded in the middle of nowhere of like New Mexico, and you're just stuck there for four days, and there's nothing you can do, and you're like. Okay, <laughs> so I just went from like the coolest fucking thing that anybody in this entire state has probably ever done, and then <laughs> now I'm now I'm at a bar in a Motel Six in Deming, New Mexico, and uh, we're getting fucking booed out of a like Elks Lodge bar because we're not members. <laughs> like, you're just Elks like, Lodge. like what the fuck are we doing? The ups, dude. The highs, the lows. The highs and lows. That's where you. That's where you come to camp. That's for, where dude. I live, though. I like them. I, I want. I want both. Yeah, dude. you can't just always have highs. Exactly. That's we've why we've had a lot of lows. You can't that's why have we lows. say we mean need... shit and we laugh on this podcast, and that's why we cry on this podcast, and that's why we. What else do we do in this podcast? Eat hot dogs. Eat hot dogs. Roast marshmallows. Uh huh. Roast each other. Yeah. No, it's been good. I really. I just love doing this every week and uh, talking and. Sometimes it's really funny. Sometimes it's like really deep and like hard to do. And my armpits smell right now because it's, <laughs> there's some uh, more emotional parts of this conversation. It's helping me, dude. It's like therapeutic for me to talk about uh, stuff we've been through, stuff that's going on. I think it, uh, you know, as we were just talking in the bathroom before this, like we usually do before a podcast starts. Yeah. Me and Ryan go to the bathroom, we stare in the mirror together and then we stare into each other's eyes for about 10 seconds. Yeah. And then we start the podcast. But we were just talking about how therapeutic it's been for us to just talk about the shit that's going on in our heads. Yeah. A lot of the time you don't know what you're going to say or what you want to say. And so just even putting it, all your crazy random thoughts into a row to try to make sense to you and to like whoever's listening. It's like, that's enough for it to kind of, it, it awakens a little bit in yourself to understand what your own thoughts are. Cause you don't really ever, I don't know. Does that make sense? Like you don't ever really collect your thoughts in a certain way to like make them make sense for other people. And I think in doing that, you start understanding what you're feeling on your own yeah because if you can sit there and you think but you can think a million different things at one time it's not like this fluid like statement you know so i think sometimes just even talking with you and saying something out loud afterwards i'm like damn i didn't realize i was even thinking that or feeling that way you know yeah it's i think it's uh the camp podcast is getting me to maybe know myself a little bit better yeah it's pretty cool that's where it gets you man i say we uh we what do I, what we, do I owe you for today? You owe me 10 hot dogs. <laughs> Deal. All right. Peace out, Kim. See you guys next week. It.